This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, a conversation with physicist and anthropologist Gregory Cochran, co-author of The 10,000-Year Explosion, How Civilization Accelerated Human Evolution. Gregory Cochran is a physicist and adjunct professor of anthropology at the University of Utah. He's also the co-author of the new book, The 10,000-Year Explosion, How Civilization Accelerated Human Evolution. Gregory, welcome to the program. Hello. First, we should start off with this idea that your book is refuting, the notion that 40 to 50,000 years ago, evolution halted just for humans. Now, on the face of it, it sounds a little strange just articulating it like that. So how did that gain the public mind so strongly? Probably most people weren't thinking about it very hard, I would guess. Uh, I would say one of the things is that uh, you could at least say that as evolutionary time goes, that isn't the longest possible time, so maybe change wouldn't be too big, at least possibly if you just picked a random 50,000 years. The, uh, of, of, you know, there's been 6 million years or, or thereabouts since the split between humans and chimps. This is not a big fraction of it in terms of absolute time. But another reason is people have, I think, mistakenly thought that when we invented, when people got to the point where they could invent solutions to at least some problems, somehow that meant you know, all our needs went away. Evolution stopped somehow. Some of this is funny. People said, well, with modern medical care, didn't that stop uh, disease matter? And I said, yeah, but if, it, if it, it made a difference, but most of the difference is in the last 70 or 100 years. It, it didn't make a difference a thousand years ago because back then medical care was useless. And so with this idea, what, what traction does it actually have? Because in the book and in other interviews, you've mentioned that the idea that evolution stopped for humans isn't actually taken that seriously within the scientific community. Where, where is it most taken seriously? I think some people sort of take it seriously. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't really understand what these people were thinking who have uh, pushed such ideas. I think what, some of it, in some cases at least, it was because, if true, it would have results they would like. But, you know, that's not a very sound way of coming up with the answer to problems. You know, like, that's the same reason I could say, I've decided that, that, that Captain Kidd buried his treasure in my backyard, because that would be <laughs> such a, hap a wonderful thing if it were true. I think that people had thought that this would show somehow that there couldn't be any substantial differences in anything we cared about between different human groups, and some people would like that to be the case. Why would they like that? They're probably for treating people equally, which I would largely agree with. And perhaps they thought that people would be more likely to support that if they thought all groups were equal. Although I don't think people usually consider that individuals are all equal. Certainly some people are tall, some people are tall, some people are short, some people are sick, some people are healthy, some people are smarter than others. Uh, but I think the idea was at least we could have hoped that all groups had exactly the same average on everything. Although clearly they're not all the same height, Clearly, they don't look the same. I think that they thought the outcome was desirable, but you, you can't make a scientific theory work by saying, you know, that if tr you know, it must be true because it would be so nice. This is, I, I assume, it's going back just to the philosophy, the logic textbook from college. This is a an argument from Final Consequences, just in its most bare form. Uh, yeah, but I've never seen those work. Yeah, well, I, exactly. It's a fallacy. It's not. It's not a uh, not a, yeah, not a working but, argument. Some other people may have thought it was, even if not true, it would be a good idea if people thought so. Yeah. I don't know. I don't really, I can't read mine. I'm not sure why. <laughs> now, your book, if we go straight to the subtitle, How Civil Civilization Accelerated Human Evolution, we know your stance. We know that human evolution, according to your book, is going on, and that it's actually going faster. Now, what, what research started to show the cracks in the idea that civilization stopped for humans. What, what was weakening that theory first? But I, I assume it's been weakening you know, before you guys came well, on the scene. Well, I doubt if, if, you looked, you know, if, you, if you looked at it 30 or 50 years ago, you wouldn't have had tremendous amounts of uh, genetic data, but you could have at least seen all sorts of observational differences in this, that, and the other thing. So, you know, it, I would say it was never in great shape. But today, there's a lot of genetic data coming out faster all the time. And we now know... Uh, for example, have at least rough estimates of how old some of genes that have particular interesting effects are. In many cases, they're not very old. Uh, for example, there is a gene that is one of, one of a set of genes that together make people in Europe have fairly light skin, and it appears that it hasn't been common for very long, uh, probably less than 10,000 years. 
maybe maybe half that, a gene called SLC24A5, which is now the, the new version that makes gives light skin is, has a 99% frequency in Europe. It appears that you know, a reasonable amount of time ago, it, it wasn't there yet. Uh, so you know, we now have age estimates on a number of genes hooked to particular things. Some of them are older than that. Some of them are younger than that. So we have new kinds of information that show how things have changed, some of them fairly recently. And of course, that is a component of the thesis that human evolution not only continues, but accelerates. Now, how do you find evidence that it has gone faster? Of course, there's the fact that you mentioned in the book, our environments have changed a lot. Is that just because of that, is it necessary then that humans have evolved faster than they would have been in the past? I would say that if you put people into a situation that's very different from the situation that they had lived in for a long time, let's say farming as opposed to being hunters and gatherers of wild plant foods, and not only just farmers, but lots of farmers, farmers, you know, because the density of population goes up a lot with farming, I would say that a lot makes it almost inevitable. I think you had any, any creature, any species, and you put it into an extremely different environment than the one it used to live in, its evolution will go faster than it had been before. I think that's almost inevitable. But in terms of genetic evidence, what we found was evidence of uh, using work by uh, Bob Moises and Eric Wang, his student, primarily, that there were a large number of genes in which it looked as if new versions had, had recently become fairly common. And if you look at the number of them, and compare them with the known differences between humans and chimps, these recent ones are appearing more rapidly than you would expect from the long-term average rate of change as established by the total number of differences. We know that humans and chimps last had a common ancestor, say, perhaps 6 million years ago. And we know the total number of differences, or at least we can estimate some kinds of them. And we can say there's this many. Divide that by 6 million years to get the rate. Okay, what's the rate we see over the past 10,000 years? Much higher than that. That's basically the molecular argument. But if you're thinking about it from first principles, you would have expected things to speed up as people moved into more and more, you know, as change sped up, as the, as the change we experienced sped up. So let's go back to when this started, when this evolutionary acceleration started, to the Upper Paleolithic. Now, was this, did this only start when agriculture began? I would say that it probably it speeded up. Uh, I think that there were things that were changing relatively rapidly, not as rapidly as post-agriculture, but more rapidly than the long-term trend before then. I mean, for example, uh, humans, modern humans appear to have existed, let's say before 50 to 70,000 years ago, they appear to have existed really only in Africa. And then sometime in that period, they expanded and settled the rest of the old world, and then also Australia, and then later the Americas. So at the very least, you're moving to new places, new environments, new climates, new diseases. So, so that started before agriculture. At the same time, it's also true that people started showing new tricks, things like uh, much more complicated technologies, at least in some areas, uh, things like eventually the bow and arrow, things like the atlatl, which is sort of a thing somewhat like a bow and arrow that works on different principles than was earlier. People started showing new abilities. And you know between... You know, the new things you could do, which, of course, affect, you know, what pays off. I mean, if you have new tools, that shapes what, what powers and abilities you should, are, are going to be most useful for you. But also moving to new lands and also the population increasing. Population was increasing partly because modern humans now covered most of the world as opposed to just Africa. That's a, that's a major increase. And the other reason is because they were getting to be better at hunter gatherings. They had learned better ways of hunting. They could you know, catch more things more safely. They could probably process certain kinds of plants, make them edible that hadn't been before. So we, it looks as if population had increased by quite a bit even before agriculture. Let's say 100,000 years ago, there might have been maybe half a million, maybe a quarter of a million uh, modern humans uh, all in Africa at that point. And by uh, the end of the Ice Age, just before agriculture started, there might have been as many as 6 million scattered over much larger areas, you know, over all of Asia, Australia, America, as well as Africa. So things were already changing, but we think they speeded up even further when you took that number and then start raising it to 60 million, 100 million, 200 million, etc., with agriculture. And so was agriculture 
I, I, I know from reading the book myself that it wasn't simply, or at least if I have the argument right, agriculture wasn't simply a change because it expanded the population. It also affected evolution because it changed what people were, for example, I mean, obviously consuming. What did that do to evolution? We know that there are some changes in, uh, that appear to be related to how long you've been eating these new diets. The new diets, we'll say, are mostly grain. You know, in in Middle East, that would be mostly wheat and barley. In uh, in the Far East, it would be more like rice and millet. But the point is, it's a big change from the previous times, where it looks as if the carbohydrate level tripled in the diet compared to that that uh, hunter gatherers were eating, and it it looks as if people who have been eating this high carbohydrate diet for a long time have fewer problems with it than people who have been eating it for a medium time or a short time. For example, it looks as if people who have not been farming very long are more prone, particularly in modern situations with less exercise and so forth, to uh, type 2 diabetes, adult onset diabetes. Uh, for example, American Indians have a higher risk. They farm, but not for as long as people in the Middle East. Uh, Australian Aborigines have a very high risk of diabetes something like 30 times that of other Australians in terms of deaths. So that's one kind of adaptation. Another one is that one of the first things people evidently did after they started growing grain was ferment it and make beer. And so people who have farmed for a long time have also been drinking for a long time. I mean, not distilled high alcohol things, but you know, beer and wine. And on the whole, people who have not done this for very long have higher problems with alcoholism and populations whose ancestors have been doing that for, say, eight or 10,000 years. Nobody is immune to these problems, but some people have more than others. This seems very uncontroversial, just to say that a group that has been doing something longer will be better at it, will be better suited to it. Now, what, what about what we've talked about so far is so outside of the mainstream about all this? Well, some people will disagree even with those things, although I haven't heard arguments much about diabetes. For example, a sociologist would say, well, uh, the Pima Indians uh, have, have problems with alcoholism because of their, their poor status in society and their, uh, in general, being oppressed and having the country stolen away from them. And I said, and certainly the country was stolen away from them, so the argument is not utterly obviously wrong. I think it is wrong, but not utterly and obviously so. But, but then you start asking, well, should, well, why would the Pima have so much more trouble than the Navajo? I said, well, genetic differences. Says, what's the real reason the Navajo have? Even they have a very high level. I said, it's probably genetic differences there. I mean, if you're going to respond to oppression, one would think that you'd throw a rock at a cop or something, <laughs> as opposed to, uh, and this is even clearer for diabetes. It's sort of hard to see how can diabetes be a protest, or is it a psychological reaction? It doesn't really look like that at all. But it looks as if, uh, you, know, you know, the point is people, some people will say it's all social causes, but there's not much evidence for that. And, there doesn't, and they don't have to be social causes. And you think about it, oh, like, for example, even to the extent that agriculture is somewhat newer in northern Europe than southern Europe, you find more alcoholism among Swedes than you do among Italians. I said, is it because the Italians have been oppressing the Swedes lately? I don't think so. <laughs> in fact, I don't see anybody oppressing the Swedes. Really. I think that it's just that people vary. Uh, you know, the point is, there are people who would disagree with, with, with some of these things that sound very reasonable. Some also people haven't looked as much at the, at the pattern over many places. Like, they'll say, for this one particular case, I think it's social. I said, but I think it's useful to look at as wide a variety of cases as possible and start noticing that uh, Polynesians also have greater diabetes risk, you know, that uh, Australians do, that, you know, you know, or, or that you notice the wide sharing of the alcoholism risk among essentially all peoples that have not done it very long. Uh, by the way, there's one interesting consequence of this, which is that uh, if you think of a new synthetic drug, something like um, heroin, for example, no one's adapted to it. There really is a way in which it's different from alcohol. Alcohol, a lot of people are somewhat hardened against it. Not perfectly so, but somewhat. But for something that's new, it's invented in the last hundred years, if it's harmless, it's pure luck. Nobody is ready for it. Given a few thousand years, then, maybe a population could evolve to adapt to heroin? Yeah, if a lot of people used it. And, uh, yeah, I don't think it's that common, so I don't think it's that likely. But, yeah, in principle, there could be other things. If there was, um, if there was some bad side... I mean, like, a lot of things simply don't cause that much trouble. Like, if you drink coffee or tea, 
the problems they cause are small. I'm not sure they really cause any. But you could imagine some different regional thing that uh, people have been, you know, that, that has some bad side effects, that, that people who have been using it a long time, you know, something other than alcohol. What would be an example? I don't know enough about what people were chewing or smoking 3,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago, but I guess I could imagine, again, you know, some other, uh, some other thing that people used to, that, that has such hazards. Oh, I don't know, cot? I don't know how long people do that in Yemen, but I don't know how long they've been doing it. But yeah, yeah, there could be other cases like this. I don't know of any off the top of my head. Alcohol, you know, alcohol is very widespread uh, as something that people have used. Uh, but yeah, there could be other things like that. I mean, there's certainly other things like that for many other local problems. I mean, certainly you take an Irishman, he's a lot more likely to get skin cancer in New Mexico than somebody who's an American Indian. We got a lot of ultraviolet here. If you know, there's differences in disease resistance, many things. But on the, as for, you know, the one I know most about is alcoholism because it's so big. You know, people do studies on the big problems before they do it on the little problems. This seems to be what amounts to an undeniable amount of evidence if you're trying to argue that genetic issues, evolutionary issues, have nothing to do with the way modern-day groups get along in the world. Uh, the idea that that we were talking about, that evolution stopped and cultural evolution took over from there. How does cultural evolution work along with biological evolution in your book's model? Well, in, in our model of how things happen, there's an interplay. And it makes, and from the point of view of somebody who's, say, a historian or somebody trying to explain uh, past patterns of human behavior, it means if you want to do a good job, life, you're going to have to learn more. Life has gotten more complicated. Uh, for example, the example of uh, uh, one example is lactase persistence. The fact that you know a significant, many people in Europe and some people in other places can continue to digest the main sugar of milk as an adult, where the sort of the default state of humans was not to do that, but to shut it off around age five. Uh, that only could have become common if people had already domesticated the you know the cow and perhaps sheep. You have to have a source of the milk. Wild animals are a very poor source of milk. I don't think that people went off and tried to wrestle an aurochs to the ground to get milk. You had to have <laughs> domesticated animals. But and even then, it was some time before a mutation that gave you that ability became common. But the point is, first you have a cultural change that gives this new thing a potential advantage. Then it becomes common. Now, we think that after it did become common, it may have increased the numbers of the groups that had that. They could switch to a new way of life where they were dairying as opposed to uh, raising cattle for beef. And that, that turns out to be much more productive per acre, produces a lot more food. Basically, a family can live off a couple of cows uh, with, with a few kids. I mean, obviously, they produce enough milk to, produce, to feed, a, to feed a, a calf, which is bigger than a human child. And this is more efficient than, uh, by a factor of something like five than uh, raising the cattle for beef. And we think that some of the first populations in which this, they, they became common may have expanded a lot. And, and more than once, because other mutations that have the same effect later became common among cattle raising groups in East Africa, and they expanded a lot. These are the tall, skinny, nilotic people, and some of them have expanded something like 1,500 miles south of where they started over the past two or 3,000 years. Uh, one group you've heard, well heard of would be the Tutsi in Rwanda and Burundi. They're 90% they're milk drinkers as adults. And another group that this. Uh, with yet another version of this mutation, which became common, was among desert Arabs, because it helps you drink camel's milk. And that was, again, linked to that invention. But again, if this had not happened, there would have been fewer Arabs in the world, and history would quite possibly have been different. You have only, say, a third as many people of a given group. They're going to have, at the very least, they'll be a less important player in history. There may be, the differences may be bigger than that. So we think that you know, culture has made certain genetic changes possible. And the genetic changes have reacted back and caused all kinds of changes, in, ultimately, in culture and history. Uh, one, one line in the book I kind of liked was that once upon a time, we thought it was enough to know about battles and kings, but life keeps getting more complicated. <laughs> well, we've discussed lactose tolerance and light skin. The other example in the book is, of course, blue eyes, a recently evolved trait, but not one that is in itself an advantage. What's the story with blue eyes? I don't think we completely know. It probably lightens your skin. You know, the, the, the same mutation that causes blue eyes appears to make your skin somewhat lighter, although it doesn't appear to have as large an effect as that other skin color gene I, uh, change I mentioned. 
And it, the reason that people suspect, and there may be, this may be right, I don't think we know for sure, but this may be right, is that light skin was favored in both Europe and also in North Asia because uh, it made it easier to produce vitamin D. Vitamin D is produced when ultraviolet hits your skin. If you're in a tropical area, even though uh, your dark skin pigment shields much of it, you'll still get plenty. The sunlight is very bright there. But in cloudy places like northern Europe with long winters, it may be that you needed lighter skin to get more vitamin D. That's probably the standard hypothesis. There may be other things going on as well. Uh, the, the other thing that has occurred to me as possible, but we don't know yet, is that many of the genes involved in making dark skin color probably have do other things in the body. Generally, that's true. It's very often the case that genes do several different things. And it's possible that, that they were sort of constrained because they had to be a certain way to make dark skin color. When you get, in a, when you get an area where you don't need the dark skin as much because the sunlight is not as bright, the ultraviolet is not as strong, it may be that, that they were free to change in a way that benefited some other function. But I don't know which one. So, I mean, I don't think we know for sure. I'd say the leading hypothesis is vitamin D, but there are other possibilities. The, the general background is that it's something that now can change because you don't have to have dark skin if you live in Ireland. One interesting thing is that the changes in East Asia are almost completely different ones than the ones that happened in Europe. When people have light skin, they have it with the, the mutations that cause it are almost entirely different. Often, with different, often changes even in different genes. This may, there may be a hint of something in this, but I don't understand it yet. In East Asia, then, it would be a different source for the same visible change. In, well, it's, in Again, the... it's not exactly the same, but it's reasonably similar. But, but it turns out, you know, what, what looks like a racial similarity is actually only skin deep. The genetics of it is different. You know, similar things happened, but they didn't happen biochemically in the same ways, or not exactly the same ways. Anyway. There's one other element I wanted to mention, I wanted to be sure not to forget in this, the role of what you call in the book, introgression. Now, what is that? Well, introgression is when you have another species, but one or another group that may be not quite as different as a full species, but it's one that can still interbreed, at least some, and, and where a limited amount of interbreeding with that other group produces a few copies of a gene, of a new version of a gene that's very useful. What, and what is This can spread even if, on the whole, you have only a little bit of a mixture with that group. Like the other genes may not be useful. They may not be spread, but, the, but the, the useful ones can. It turns out that so even a very small amount of mixing between two groups can have big long-term consequences. There was an interesting example of this that was in some of the news just in the past couple of weeks. People were noticing that uh, there's quite a few wolves in North America that are black. Evidently, this did not used to be the case. When they looked at it genetically, it looked, turns out they all have a sort of recent mutation, which is causing wolves to be black. And it appears they picked it up from dogs. Now, we know dogs sometimes intermix with wolves, but it's not that this has happened in an enormous amount. But what it is is this particular gene that makes a wolf black somehow had quite a bit of advantage. So it spread rapidly, even though other dog genes generally didn't, you know, the, of the ones that were mixed into wolves. And there are several wolf populations that now have quite a bit of this gene that makes them black. Uh, it appears that there's a strong suspicion that the way this change happens is not really the blackness, which is the advantage. It looks as if it might be a defense against some disease. When you look at the biochemistry of it. It's like blue eyes, then. It's, a, it's, it's something else that's really going on. Probably. But, but, but the point is that uh, even a little bit of mixing can have a big long-term consequence. You could, be, you could have, uh, let's say, a few dogs uh, mated with wolves, and then someday it might be the point that all wolves had that black gene, even though they didn't have most of the other dog genes. The genes succeed on their own, on their own merits, more or less. Even a small amount of mixing, if it brings in something new and useful, can in the long run be very important. So what kind of a chance does a useful mutation have to be propagated when it reaches from one species to another? Well, if you had just one copy, one copy of this gene, and let's suppose it had a 5% advantage, its chance, and this is in a simple model, but its chance of spreading until everyone has it might be as big as 10%. Whereas if you had a gene that was, let's say, effectively the same, I mean, it was different, you could measure a difference, but it, it acted the same, it didn't have any advantage, then having one copy of that gene, what's the chance it will increase until everybody in the world has it? I said almost nothing. 
having a systematic advantage makes increases the chances of it becoming common a lot. Um, in the book, I mention an example, which I hope reaches people. It says, imagine that you were playing roulette, and it was a very fair roulette game. The house had no advantage. So it's just, you have a 50% chance. If you, if you bet on black, you have a 50% chance of being right. Okay, we give you one, we give you one counter, one chip. What is the chance that you'll just, by sheer luck, you'll wipe out the casino? Very low, right? But suppose you have a magical ability. You can call the correct answer 55% of the time instead of 50. You have a little bit of an edge. Your chance of wiping out the casino is 18% if we give you one chip. Very similar to this, the chance of a, of a good mutation spreading. The math is essentially equivalent. By the way, this is something that sounds unintuitive. You wouldn't think you'd have much of a chance of wiping out. with, But if you have this edge, there is a noticeable chance. And if you had several chips, say 20, you'd almost be certain. It's to, the reverse of what the house has, then. It's if you have, they have a slight edge, but if you have a slight edge, you've got the long-term edge. Well, and the point is, you have a reasonable chance of getting to the long-term, even if we give you only one chip, which is sort of like a mutation. You start out with one copy. Or if you had, if you had by integration, you might get more than one copy, because you might have more than one hybrid between your group and the other group. But we know some examples of this. I mean, we actually know quite a few. But that one with the dogs and wolves is one that's recent. And now, what introgression do you suspect happened with humans? Now, this is merely a likelihood. We don't know it for sure, although we should be able to establish this one way or another over the next few years. When modern humans left Africa, there were other groups that had already left Africa, say, a million years earlier, already colonized the warmer parts of the old world. The one we're most familiar with is Neanderthals. Well, there were other groups that also were called archaic humans in East Asia. Now, those groups were all pretty much replaced by modern humans. But it's at least possible there was a little bit of interbreeding. And what we're saying is if there was even a little bit of interbreeding, it's likely we picked up any genes they had that were particularly useful. And it would be surprising if they had nothing that was useful. Nothing else. They were adapted to some of these areas that they've been there a long time. And the other thing is, knowing humans, the idea that there was at least a little bit of admixture with these somewhat different creatures, I said, well, we've tried stranger things than that. <laughs> How well do we know that a uh, human and a Neanderthal could produce viable offspring? We don't know for sure, but we know it's highly likely because when we know approximately how long ago Neanderthals and modern humans split, which is about half a million years. And we know that in other species, when the split is that recent, they're almost always still able to interbreed. I, it's not a certainty, but, the, uh, but you know, nine, more than nine times out of ten, in a situation like this, where the split is half a million years, it should be possible. So we we're saying it's likely. It's not certain, but it's highly likely that it was still possible. What sort of useful mutations would come from Neanderthals hybridizing with humans? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, if some of it might be adaptation. Like, suppose there were diseases outside of Africa that they had experienced and we had not. You'd think they'd have some defenses. That's a possibility. They might have had some adaptations to cooler climates that, that, that could have been useful among in humans in some groups. It also might be that even when they're solving some of the same problems, because, you know, their brains were just as large as modern humans and had developed on their own in that direction. And the point is, obviously those brains were good for something. They wouldn't have developed that way. Now, maybe that certain of the problems they solved, perhaps little variations in brain development or whatever, some of those things that happened might, you know, sometimes they have, would have happened to solve a particular problem, even if it's the same problem, in a way that would be more effective than something in Africa. Now, on the whole, this wasn't true because... You know, modern humans coming out of Africa replaced them pretty rapidly, but that doesn't mean that they had nothing that wasn't useful. There's an interesting example on this just recently. In a sense, you can say there's integration happening in people today. For example, uh, when you look at um, people in Mexico who are, it varies from place to place and group to group, but roughly speaking, they're about half Spanish and about half Indian in ancestry. But people looked and they found a couple of interesting examples of a particular region in which people were much more Spanish than they were in other regions of the genome. Now, my guess, if this holds up, if this is correct, is that that was a little piece of a chromosome that had something like a smallpox defense. You might say many of the other genetic versions that Spanish had would be just about the same as those that 
as you you know, no, not much better or worse than those of an of an Indian. But that was one the Indians were not good at. It's one that the Europeans were better at. So at that particular gene, that population is more Spanish than they are on average, and by quite a bit. Rather, now right now we only know a particular region, and I don't. We don't know that it's a smallpox defense. So I just offer that as a reasonable possibility because that's a thing that we know that the, the Spanish had a lot less trouble with than the Indians. This is a segment of the population there that is literally in a geographic region? Well, yeah, we're talking about the Rio Grande Valley. Okay. I mean, somebody did look at it and says, you know, these people are about half Spanish, but on this one gene, they're a lot more than half Spanish. Or I should say, this one region, they haven't pinned it down to an exact gene. My guess is there's a useful gene in that region that the Spanish had the better version of. And the most reasonable thing that comes to mind, something that was devastating for, that was merely awful for Spanish, but was devastating for the Indians, was smallpox. But, it, you know, something like that. There could be other possibilities, but that's the one that would jump to my mind. In the book, you talk about how, as far as the idea of human intergression anywhere along the line with, you know, Neanderthals, there is a certain amount of simply distaste for the idea used as refutation against it. Now, how much of the opposition to this is actually simple distaste versus evidence-based? I would say some of it might, we might call it academic uh, uh, naiveness. Like, I've, I've read people said, you know, Neanderthals looked fairly different. I can't imagine that any human would ever want to mate with something like that. And I'm thinking, there are certain experiences you have not shared with others. You've probably never been on a ship that came into port. <laughs> I said, you probably never even read about it. And you may not have heard, you've, not, you've never read any, um, any police accounts in farm areas that involve sheep. <laughs> but all these things do happen. Or I said, not only that, I would say that you aren't as, uh, you haven't had a proper literary education. I'm thinking of a scene in the Brothers Karamazov in which there was a particularly retarded girl and several, uh, several uh, r- uh, you know, Russians, including Theodore Karamazov, Somebody says, could anyone look upon her as a woman? And they bet. He said, I could. And that, and that produces Shmerdikov, who, of course, causes all kinds of trouble later. I said, people will do the weirdest things. They'll do it on a bet. But it doesn't seem to get through to those who are simply dead set against the idea. Well, I think some of them, uh, another factor is that, you know, you have to look at the math of how likely uh, a favorable mutation is to spread. I, I could certainly see many people, paleontologist types, would say, well, even if there was a little interbreeding, I'm sure, it was, uh, I'm sure it wouldn't have been significant. I said, that's because you don't know how the genetics work. A little bit of interbreeding, if, if any given gene, if they had even one gene that was more useful, there would have been a fairly good chance we would have picked it up. If we had even a limited number of interbreeding events, suppose that the total number of such events that ever happened over thousands of years was, say, 50. I said, that would be enough that we would likely pick up most useful genes they had that, that had an edge of a couple of percent or more. The thing is, they don't realize because they don't know the math. So when someone says that no one could have ever mated with a Neanderthal, they would have been too ugly, you can just say back to them, well, they didn't need to, a human didn't need to have to mate with a Neanderthal many times for this to take hold. No, no. But the other thing is, I would also say is, I believe I have a lot of data that refutes the, the your idea about people being really picky about such things is, I have to say that experience shows that you are not correct. I could find enough evidence from a single fraternity. (laughs) Now, I wanted to go back to 2005 with the paper that preceded this book, your paper on, on, of course, uh, European Jewish intelligence. Now, what was the thesis of that paper, for those who don't know about it? Um, The thesis is fairly simple. An awful lot of evidence today, in terms of accomplishment, but also things like psychometric tests, IQ tests, suggest that, on average, European Jews are somewhat smarter than the human average. Let's say if the average in Europe is 100 IQ, they might score 112. Average. And in, a, in terms of accomplishment, it means things like very high overrepresentation in things like uh, scientific awards, Nobel Prizes, things like that. I mean, I think this is something most people can, can easily confirm, that there is such a pattern. The other thing, which is sort of less known, but still fairly well known, is they have an odd pattern of genetic diseases which are essentially unique to them for the most part. And our suggestion is that there was, in this group, there was strong selection, natural selection for IQ, and that some mutations that boosted IQ became common, but with side effects, in the same sense that uh, 
some of the defenses against malaria, have, such as sickle cell, have bad side effects when you have two copies, and that uh, it's all the same story, that it was a case of natural selection for intelligence, that ha and, and the same explanation explains the intelligence and also explains Tay-Sachs and some other uh, surprisingly common genetic diseases. Correct me if I'm wrong then, but it would be, the model would be one, one copy of a gene would bring intelligence, two copies would bring a you know, neurological disorder. More completely, of the ones that are like that, those are the ones that my doctors study, there could also have been changes that had moderate boosting effects that either did nothing or did nothing that anybody cares about. Uh, we're not saying that the ones that cause obvious disease are the only or the main, even necessarily the main ones involved. But what we are saying is that we think that's why they became common. There should also be changes in the frequency of other genes that don't have, either they don't have side effects or they have side effects that, that truthfully nobody would care about today. For instance, suppose there was a gene that was in many populations, like suppose there were two variants, one that tended to make you a little smarter, one that made you a little less smart. But normally there was a cost to it. Perhaps the one that made you smarter made you slightly slower in running or something. Okay, so in many populations that would sort of balance the advantages and the disadvantages. What if in this group running was not so important? Then that one would go up some. It wouldn't cause any obvious disease. At the most, it might make you not win the Olympics. But who would know? The, disease, the ones that cause serious diseases are the ones that have been well studied because that's what doctors do. There are probably other things that either have no side effects or side effects that we don't care about. They may have been side effects that would have mattered in some situations. Like, here's another one. Suppose you had something that made you slightly smarter, but as a side effect, it made you require slightly more food. In some populations, that might not, that might not fly. It might not work. But if you had a population that wasn't short on food, it might. But, and, and, and who would notice it today? Probably no one. It, it wouldn't make much difference on, on things. It wouldn't cause a, what we would call a disease. So we think that some of these things you know, that showed up, our, our selection for IQ, and again, one copy probably gives you a plus, while two is causing harm. But those, that's the tip of the iceberg. Those are the ones that show up in medicine. We don't think those are the only genes involved. Now, when this, this paper was published in 2005, it, it seemed to catch such an unusually high level of reactions on all sides of it. I had many people send me links to it with varying commentaries from each person. Why did this capture the popular imagination so much, do you think? Well, for one thing, Jews found it interesting, and they're a pretty big fraction of the uh, people, reporters and writers and so forth. That's one reason. One reason, I was saying something, you're not supposed to say that there are differences in IQ between different groups, even though they exist every time you measure, make a measurement. The other thing is we were coming up with an explanation. I mean, the reason I did it is because I had known about, for example, those, um, some of those uh, genetic diseases for quite a while, and, and they'd always been considered an anomaly. You know, why are, they, why are they so common in this particular population, but not in people who live across the street? But the thing that got me particularly interested in this is I found out some of the effects of those mutations when people study them, you know, in, uh, in, in animal models or in vitro, you know, in a bad way, even in the patients who are ill, you have neurons sprouting new connections in, uh, that, that normally don't in advanced cases of Tay-Sachs, and you can have this happen in a model too. In Gaucher disease, another one which is, again, biochemically similar, you have several of these all affect the same enzyme path. In Gaucher disease, when they make a, a model of it, uh, the, the culture neurons they grow have more branches, have more connections. I'm thinking, this is interesting. This is um, uh, you know, a hint of how something like this could be useful. And I had not known until you know, sometime a little, a little before 2005 that what, what those, these interesting effects of these mutations I said, there's a story here. At least there's a good chance. Let's look. So, I mean, the reason I did it was because I thought it was an interesting puzzle. Now, as why people reacted as they did, ask them. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of interest, but it was sort of an odd interest because, it, you know, we got covered in the New York Times and Economist, but in terms of general newspapers, not, not very much. It, it was like only at a certain high level was their interest in, at, in you know, Time, Newsweek, most newspapers, they didn't ever mention it at all. Which I, I mean, I didn't care, but I thought it was interesting. Sort of an odd pattern. One of the most fascinating elements of the critiques that, at least I thought, and that you mentioned as well in other interviews, is that 
whenever someone had a criticism, they would be coming from one field and they would be critiquing it from the perspective of another. A population geneticist would be critiquing the history or vice versa, for example. Was that really the case with everything that came in? Oh, you're getting me to talk about the reviews. They were a hoot. All right. I think we must have gone through six journals, which is not a record, but it, I thought it was weird. One of them, the guy, you know, like one of the key things is, is in our model, but also confirmed what, what, what we can learn of history. There are a couple of requirements for any process like this to happen. You need to be reproductively isolated. You have to not be intermarrying very much with your neighbors. If you do that very much, you'll be like them. That's inevitable. Mixing means blending. If you if you mix very much, so you can estimate, like, there, you know, how low a mixing rate there can be if to make the mechanism we're talking about possible. And we were able to investigate that, and it appeared to be the case. You know, very low, not zero, but very low. The other thing is that. Um, you need to be in a situation where somehow the quality that's increasing is more rewarded than other populations. Back in the Middle Ages, almost entirely Ashkenazi Jews, European Jews, had what, some kind of white-collar occupation where they weren't working with their hands or their back. Now, this varied some from time to time what they were doing, but it was always true that the great majority of them were doing this. And this wasn't true for any other group. Everybody else was mostly farmers. They, but the other, other thing... So part of that meant looking at the history, saying, what were people doing in 1300, 1400, 1500, 1200? Again, this is a case where we know enough we can tell something. We have some history. The other thing is that it had to be a situation where people who were very successful at these jobs had more kids. Now, that's a tra that's, not everyone knows this, but that's the way it used to be before the Industrial Revolution. The richer you were, the more kids you had survive. Today, it's, if anything, the opposite. I mean, I have more kids than Bill Gates. Woo! <laughs> He's got two. I've got five. And I also make less money than him. Just to prove uh, to be paradoxical. But before <laughs> the Industrial Revolution, typically the richer people were, the more kids they had survived. And, and we, have, we have evidence that in Jewish families, the people who were very successful at these white-collar jobs, who made a lot of money, they might have as many as six kids survive, whereas people who were not very successful, couldn't get those jobs or couldn't handle them, they might have numbers like less than two. How and, long does it take for all this to show up, for all these qualities to show up in, in the expressed qualities of the humans down the line? Well, it's not instantaneous, but it doesn't take forever. I mean, you're never going to notice. It would, it would take an extraordinarily strange situation to make a noticeable difference in one generation. Like, maybe if we shot everybody who didn't have red hair. That's about what it would take, okay, to make a real difference in one generation. But over a, a, thousand, gener a thousand years, it's about 40 generations. I mean, about 25 years for a generation, which is considered to be about right. If you had a situation where, assuming we were giving IQ tests, which didn't exist yet, if the people who had kids averaged one point higher than the average population they were drawn from, in other words, there's just a little bit of greater success. By the way, we're not saying it's all IQ. We're saying, we're saying IQ has, or intelligence, has some influence on how much money you make. It's not the only influence, but all we're assuming is it makes some. So let's suppose the people who are making the serious money averaged, and who were, had most of the kids, say, averaged one IQ point higher in a generation. I think you'd have trouble even noticing it at the time. But that's enough, because IQ is fairly heritable. It's at least, has a heritability of at least 40%. And to get a rough estimate of the change over a thousand years, you just multiply the number of generations, 40, times the you know, the delta per generation, which is one in this model, times the heritability, which we, I will assume is around half, although it's probably higher than that. And then you have a difference of, say, 12 points. Not very complicated. This isn't the only example of this sort of thing. No, in... I mean, every, every time we breed any animal or plant, agriculturally, we're doing selection like this, usually. And, and they say, we, we pick, you know, the top 10% of, of, the, of, the, of, of, say, the cows for their milk production. And then we know how heritable milk production is, and we know how much change we expect in the next generation if we pick the top 10%. And then we want to see the total change. It's how many generations we run this. It's not very comp. I mean, you can do more complicated versions if you want to use a matrix formulation, but it doesn't change the general. You know, this is a good, enough for, good enough for a rough estimate. I mean, it's not like I know the exact amount. I'm, we're just saying that it's plausible. It doesn't take a lot. It takes an unusual situation, though, for everybody to be for the great majority of jobs to be white-collar jobs because you know, this just wasn't true for anyone else. 
How much or how rigorous can an argument that like this that combines history and genetics be? How rigorous can it be made? Well, you can improve it. I mean, one thing is if we start digging people up from a thousand years ago in a Jewish cemetery, we can see how the we can probably see how the gene frequencies have changed. We could do studies in which we look for look for carriers of Tay Sachs compared with, say, siblings who are not carriers, and see if there's any difference on an IQ test. There are things we could do. Oh, I wanted to say a little bit more about uh, running into our reviews. Because, for example, I had to cite a lot of history to say, this is what history says were the jobs of Jews 700 years ago. And I had people saying, but I thought that they were all farmers back then. And I say, why on earth would you think that? And then I thought, let me guess, he watched Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> and then I asked him, and that is where he got the idea. <laughs> he had watched Fiddler on the Roof. He says, I don't know why I'm bothering to read medieval history, because you can beat me every time just by watching a movie. I said, and you're, and you're wrong. There was even, you know, I could find census data from 1900, like the fraction of Jews were farmers in Eastern Europe. You know, this is recent, but at least there is census data for that period. Maybe like 1%, 2%, where, for a country where 70% of everybody was a farmer. He said, oh, you're probably right. Well, we couldn't have published it anyhow. It was too controversial. I said, so why did we go through the last six months? <laughs> An appeal to Fiddler on the Roof sounds... I mean, I'm not a scientist, but it sounds pretty crazy? far below. It, it, yes, yeah, crazy, but it sounds far below this the the standards of professionalism for journal review. Well, that just proves you have a lot. We got better than that. We, I had another journal where the the editor was sort of interested in, and was saying, I think maybe we should have some people take a look with it. She happened to casually mention this to her dean, who said, if you do that, I will close down the journal. Yikes. We had a third one in which we convinced the editor and one of the reviewers that what we had made sense, and the, the editor said, I think you've shown that these mutations are not the result of drift. You know, we ended up doing some genetic modeling to show, try to show that. You know, drift means you know, chance but happening in very small populations, which is basically the other way you can get high frequencies of these things. If, if you're founded by a very small number of people and they just happen to have a high frequency of gene X or Y, but we are able to come up with pretty good evidence that that wasn't the case, which, by the way, is much stronger now because we have a lot better genetic data today. And he said, well, I, how about we print that? We don't, tell you, we don't print your part of what you think it is that caused it. I said, sorry, no. But it was still, I figure we want a moral victory in that case. How much of this sort of thing is simply an opposition, a pre-existing opposition to publishing papers about intelligence and human groups? And genetics and so forth, a lot of it. Again, that's my best interpretation. I can't read in people's minds. I can listen when they talk, though. When somebody says, it was too controversial, we never would have printed it anyhow, even though I think you probably have made your point, I said, then why did you review it? If the answer was always going to be no. You could have saved yourself. We could have saved all of us six months. But yeah, uh, people don't want to do it. I mean, one of the examples that we found is there's a particular mutation, not too common among the Ashkenazi, but it's kind of spectacular. Uh, the people who have it often end up with muscle very serious muscle spasms. It's called torsion dystonia. However, everybody who runs in and who has worked with them said, well, boy, they're smart. By the way, not everyone has these bad side effects, so it can still end up potentially a net plus. About 10% of the carriers have this problem. But uh, I found, so there was literature back in the 70s in neurology magazines saying, oh, yes, by the way, this makes you smart. I said, what? That's fascinating. Didn't anybody ever check it out? No. I talked to the guy who was retired who had done this work, he said, I he worked at NIH, in neurogenetics. He said, I thought it was interesting. I wanted people to look at it. They just looked at me and said, no, we're not interested. What could be less interesting than a gene that makes you smart, smart enough to notice the difference? They, w they wouldn't look. They didn't want to look. Makes you wonder what else is buried in 30 or 40-year-old journals. Is there a way to make, on, on your end, to make this sort of work with intelligence and genes more palatable for a journal to, to publish or to consider? Perhaps they should get drunk first. Uh, <laughs> I mean, a lot of people are saying, if I do this, they will pull my money from NIH and I will never get any again. I said, and they're right, they will. Other people will say, well, in academia, I will not get along with people if I push this controversial thing that right-thinking people are not supposed to talk about. I said, well, it's up to you. I think there's a lot of pressures against it. In a sense, I thought, although I mean, I found this, you know, from my point of view, it was sort of positive because it leaves things with lots of clues that all point to one simple answer sort of left on the table. Otherwise, I would think somebody would have written this up a long time ago. Although, you know, some of the information is new, but I think there was enough 
you could have done a decent version of the model years ago, many years ago. People didn't want to. And I did because I thought it was interesting. Also because I said, look, you understand things now and then you can do something good with it. But it's really hard to uh, you know, cure a disease or, or help somebody just by trying not to think about certain things. And on that subject, your book is fairly optimistic, it seems to me, about the possibilities of what what can be accomplished by humankind if they spend a little more time thinking about this exact sort of thing, intelligence, genetics, human evolution in recent, well, recent years doesn't quite work, but in recent times. Now, what do you think humankind stands to gain if their mindset changes away from the more purely geography, purely cultural, more of a guns, germs, and steel view to a genetically infor- and evolutionarily informed one? Well, I would say that uh, there's certainly some medical payoffs. I mean, if we could understand more about why some groups are more or less susceptible to diabetes, if we get lucky, we might be able to do more positive things to prevent it. I'm not promising this, but it seems like a reasonable possibility. If I promised it, I would have people call me immediately, and I don't know how to do to help them. But I believe that you know, looking at that could be useful. One of the examples I mentioned was something called fetal alcohol syndrome, you know, which can happen when... Uh, uh, mothers drink quite a bit during pregnancy. There can be serious problems in the offspring. But it happens a lot more in some groups than others. Like, for example, the fetal alcohol syndrome appears to be very rare in continental Europe, very rare in France, for example. But I don't think it's because no one ever drinks. Put it mildly. <laughs> but I mean very rare, you know, 30 times rarer than, say, among American Indian populations. I think there's a possibility that not only have some groups gotten more used to alcohol in the sense of being more resistant to alcoholism. Again, not perfectly resistant, but somewhat more resistant. But they also may have be better at at, survive, at you know avoiding side effects. Again, you know, evolution should do that too. And if you understood that, and you could prevent, uh, you know, some cases by if you understood the, what was going on, that'd be great. But you know, a more general way of saying it says you could, there's been a lot of different natural experiments happening in different parts of mankind. I'm perfectly willing to learn all I can from every one of them. And I figure we can do a few useful things with this. Maybe a lot. I wouldn't know. But I think it's worth a shot. I mean, for example, there's a famous, I mentioned in the book, this, this little uh, Lamon Sulgarda, this little town in Italy. There's a mutation which is essentially only found among people in this town. By the way, you may have heard of it. That's, they filmed part of Quantum of Solace at that town. Evidently it has great streets for car chases or something. <laughs> Very pretty town, very beautiful town. I couldn't believe how pretty the town was when I looked found some pictures of it. But there's a mutation that appears to protect people from heart disease. People with have it tend have a real tendency to live to be a hundred. Why not learn from it? But more generally, go and look at all the villages. You know, go go to every obscure corner of the world. Look at what the natural experiments in humankind. Maybe we can learn things. That one, by the way, there are people working on drugs based on that piece of knowledge. Now, I don't know for sure if they'll work. It does seem to have positive effects in the people, but it doesn't mean we can always duplicate it with a drug. But people are working on that, and, and it may work. So, but there must be many towns. I mean, there must be many towns somewhere in China that no one has ever looked at genetically. Some of them might have something useful that, you know, that hasn't spread far yet. Or, you know, in some village in Bolivia. I mean, the but by the way, if people do this, it would also be a good thing if they found a way to cut the people involved in on any money made. So they won't feel like they're totally used. But I'm just saying, there's a million natural experiments out there. Let's see what we can learn from them. Have you seen any increased willingness to perform these kind of natural experiments at all? Well, I think we could probably get people to do it if we could call it another name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if we didn't talk about human evolution and so forth. But the point is, you know, Having a theoretical understanding will tell you sometimes where to look. Uh, but I, there, as I said, there's at least some interest in that one town in Italy, and I would think that there are other places. I mean, pharmaceutical companies in general have been kind of having a dry spell. I would think they want to look for something. They've been having more trouble coming up with new drugs that do positive things and where the side effects are not uh, trouble. I mean, in some cases it's been actually kind of unpleasant, you know, like Vioxx. I think looking for... You know, natural variation in humans that will have some medical implications is probably something they should take a look at. And at the worst, it won't work. I mean, it can't hurt to look. The first step, I suppose, would be to admit that humans, in fact, are continuing to evolve. 
Well, I mean, I think there's, if we can put this into PowerPoint, I'm sure we can skip anybody admitting anything. I mean, it could just be a mysterious reason why this works. Like, I, for example, like one of the most uh, uh, powerful uh, trends in medicine was finding antibiotics, and most of those were something that was grown by some sort of mold or bacteria, penicillin, streptomycin, cephalosporins, and so forth. Now, generally speaking, the reason that these chemicals are made by these organisms is a way to kill competitors, fight uh, you know, other things growing near them. You know, the classic example is when penicillin started growing, it killed off the bacteria on, this, on, the, on, the, do on the plate, which is how we noticed it in the first place. But for example, there have been famous people who worked in this area, Selman Waxman, who was involved in some indirect way in uh, coming up with streptomycin got the Nobel Prize for something his graduate student did. But he said, oh, I don't think evolution had anything to do with it at all. Now, I think he was dead wrong. But the point is, he still got the work done. They don't have to believe in it. I don't insist that anybody believe in anything. But I do think that, uh, I think theory is useful. But, you know, I start, physicists often think that. We're weird. <laughs> uh, biologists are much less inclined to think that, and MDs probably even less. I mean, if, I, if we could turn them on to certain research areas, even if there's, they don't know why they're doing it. As long as they do it, that would be all that matters. The name of the book, once again, is The 10,000-Year Explosion, How Civilization Accelerated Human Evolution. Gregory Cochran, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the program. Thank you. Our music is produced by Ben Althaus. Find out more about his work at benalthaus.com. And for more podcasts, our complete interview archive, and more, check out colinmarshallradio.com.